Okay, turn to the book of Mark, if you would, please. As you do that, how many were at the tomato festival? Anybody besides me? How many felt like I ignored you? Because I didn't have a clue it was you. How many did I call by the wrong name yesterday? <laughs> That's the problem with getting to know all these names. I know I'm calling you by the wrong one probably half the time. But uh, please forgive me, and I'll forgive you for calling me Pastor Dave. Uh, had a good time. Got some local culture yesterday. I feel like we're fitting in. And uh, we were also at uh, the mar market, center, center market, what do you call that? I don't know. Central, Central market. Central market, Manchester City. Yeah. Got it. And we were there, uh, enjoyed our anniversary, had an anniversary hoagie. That was our big day, Central Market. Uh, 28 years, praise the Lord, for my wife and for God's blessing through all those years. Uh, halfway to 56, babe. So uh, we're, we're getting closer. Uh, thank you. Good to have family back here. I've got a, a sister, a cousin, a niece, a girl that's like a sister, uh, and my niece's uh, kids and my cousin's kids. I don't even know how to do it. I feel like Lisa, when she comes here to church, she's related to all of you somehow. Uh, but take time to greet them if you would. And uh, glad to have all of them here. The book of Mark. So I want to explain a couple things, and I don't want you to feel insulted if you already know it, but just by, by way of explaining my, my preaching in different kinds of writings. So we're in the book of Mark, and Mark is history, right? It's the story of Jesus, and it's called the gospel. It's the life of Christ, and so we treat it as if it's actual story. And so when I preach in the book of Mark, I would be preaching a narrative style of preaching. Meaning I'm basically going to tell you the story and we're going to make application to it. Now I know some of you are more into, you want to know the Greek and the Hebrew and all that. But I don't believe that's what should be happening when we're in narratives. I want to tell you the story and then we're going to make application. Some of you are going to say, oh I absolutely love that kind of preaching. And you're going to enjoy it, you're going to soak it up. Others of you are going to say it's kind of boring. And that's okay because we're going to have the other styles as well. I just explained to you three styles of preaching. One would be inductive, one would be deductive, uh, one would be narrative, which could involve both. One is where you, you uh, I'll let, say it to you this way, there's, there's uh, homiletical preaching or uh, exegetical or expository preaching. Then there would be textual preaching. Textual preaching is where you get your main points from one passage, but all your sub points come from all over. Expository preaching is when you get all of your points from one text and all of your subpoints. Once in a while, reference other uh, passages. Topical preaching is where you get your points all over, and there's a place for all of that. Most of what I do is expository preaching. There are times when I'll do topical. There are times when I'll do textual. Pastor Ed's last sermon here was a great example of a textual sermon. So topical all over. Textual, main points from one text, but subpoints from all over. Uh, expository is when everything comes from one passage. Predominantly, that's what I'm doing. At this point, I'm in history, so I'm going to be doing narrative preaching, as opposed to when I'm preaching through Paul's studies, which would be, you know, Paul writes these letters to be very detailed. Here's what to do, here's how to do it. And in those instances, you'll have a much more detailed sermon. When I'm preaching narrative, I want you to get into the story. I want you to feel the story, see the story, smell the story. I want you to get into the story. That's what the book of Mark is going to be like. The, the title of the series is Join the Mission. And I say that because I want you to join this mission. When we get into the book of Mark, we're going to be like walking along with the disciples. They're going to begin, Jesus calls them, and then Jesus is teaching them things about the gospel all along the way. Halfway through the book, he's going to remind them of what he's trying to teach them. They don't get it. And then at the end of the book, we're going to have it stated again what, what Jesus wants to teach all of these guys. And they're finally going to get it. But it wasn't one of the disciples that markedly gets it in the book of Mark. And I'll show you that in just a little bit. So we're in the book of Mark, a few things about Mark, and I, I want to do the introduction. I could have spent a whole sermon on this, but I just want to give it to you briefly, 
You can look up some of the stuff I have on the handout there, so I'm not going to go through all of that. How many of you remember Mark? What, what was the situation Mark was in? When does his name come up prominently in your mind? There was, there was a controversy about him, right? What was it? Yeah, with, with Paul and Barnabas, right? So you had two really godly guys who disagreed. What do you think of that? <laughs> Is that possible in a church to have two really godly guys and they disagree? Yes. Can it be healthy? Yes. Absolutely. My question is, which one of those guys was right? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Or it does matter, but they both were right in some ways, and they probably were both wrong in some ways, huh? Amen. But the neat thing about Mark is that Mark, all right, so we find Mark in Acts chapter 12. He's in his house. His mother owns this house. She owns a fairly large house. By the way, the pattern in scriptures was people who had would be the sponsors of the missionaries or the pastors. And it seems that Mark's mother was a sponsor. She helped the ministry to go forward. And one of the ways she helped it to go forward, because she had a nice house, she had some means, was that she was having church in her house. Now, house church isn't the highest ideal, because as you go through the book of Acts, the house church was the embryonic church, and then we see the church developing throughout the book of Acts. So those of you who crave house churches, let me take you to China and show you the chaos that can come out of just being a house church. Because there's not enough trained men, uh, men to, to be pastors there. And so it's very difficult. They're meeting in a house. She's sponsoring these people. And what, what are they in their, her house for? Do you remember in Acts chapter 12? There was a problem. They called a prayer meeting. What was the problem? Peter was in prison, right? They're having a prayer meeting. This is Mark's house. It's his mother's house. And they're praying, and God providentially answers that prayer. By the end of the book of Mark, Paul and Barnabas decide, hey, this guy, this guy's going to be good for ministry, and they take him with them on the ministry. So they're traveling around, preaching the word, starting churches, and then Mark decides this really isn't for him. It's kind of like some of the farmers who hire a guy and they leave halfway through the day and you never see him again. It was like, well, will we hire that guy again? You ever had that happen, Dan? Noah didn't do that, did he? Oh, man, just making sure. So they leave halfway through the day and then you're thinking, will I hire that guy again? That's kind of what I picture with Paul and Barnabas. Barnab uh, uh, Mark bags on them halfway through or, or at the end. And Paul's like, yo, why, why are we going to take this guy again? Can you tell me again why we're taking Mark? Because I'm telling you, we're doing a work and we got to get a job done. And I don't have time to mess around. We're not taking Mark. And Barnabas, praise the Lord for our Barnabases, amen, had a kind heart and wanted to keep working with Mark. We see Mark showing up a few times. He, he works with Peter. We see him in Rome with Peter in 1 Peter. We see him with Paul. They reconciled. They got things right. And, and, and Mark then became very important to Paul again. Paul said, bring Mark with you when you come. This is towards the end of his life. And so it wasn't a deal breaker that at one point in time, Paul didn't think much of Mark. But now we have Mark at the end of his life. Here's who Mark was. Mark was likely the scribe for Peter. Mark followed Peter around. Where did Peter end up at the end of his life? Likely. Anybody know? It was in Rome, right? This is why the Roman Catholics believe that Peter was the first pope. Now, if I say Paul and Peter interchangeably, I apologize. He was with Peter, and some people believe Peter was the first pope. Now, I go through church history with you and prove to you that he was not, but he was in Rome, and he was very prominent, he was very important. And by the way, I do not believe in apostolic succession. And we can talk about that another time if you would like to. But Peter was in Rome. And it's likely that Mark was there with him. Mark was his scribe, his letter writer. He wrote the things down that Peter needed. It's likely that somewhere after Peter's life, that Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark. Now Mark was not an eyewitness to all of the events of the life of Christ. But he heard a first-hand account. As he followed Peter around and listened to his preaching, he heard everything that Peter had to say, likely over and over. 
the same stories, real stories, not made up, about the life of Christ. So sometime subsequent to Peter passing away, Mark writes down the Gospel of Mark. Now Mark is the first of the, uh, the Gospels. It's the first time this type of writing has been done, likely. And it's called a Gospel, meaning good news. It's simply put what we've always heard that it was. It's good news. And we can say more about it, but uh, today probably won't be the day to do that. He writes this letter sometime after Peter has died, a martyr, likely a martyr for the sake of Christ. And it's, it's Peter and Mark that are there. Mark's writing these things down. Now, what do we know about Rome during this time? So picture with me. We're at about 65, maybe 66 A.D. When Mark's writing this down, who's he writing to? Likely the Italian people that are there. The times are hard. There's this real bad guy in Rome. What's his name? His name starts with an N. Nero, real bad guy, hates the Christians. Well, he didn't start out so bad, but he became pretty bad. Now, before Nero, there were those who kicked out both Christians and Jews. Do you think of anybody ever kicked out of Rome in the Bible? The, the one person's name begins with a P and the other with an A. Priscilla and Aquila had been kicked out of Rome. They're ministering. And by the way, sometimes when believers are scattered, it's a blessing. Because I feel like churches sometimes hoard their resources. And so scattering can be beneficial. Well, I'm not in favor of any kind of church split or any of that. Don't get me wrong. But to scatter the resources. Listen, if we all lived in Washington Borough, who would win Lancaster? If we were all in Lancaster, who would win upstate New York? Or who would win all these other cities? Believers have a mission before God. We're to go out and give the gospel. Nonetheless, we have here Mark. He's in Rome. It's in a very difficult time. This is likely written after Rome was burnt. And who did Nero blame the burning of Rome on? Christians. How many here have ever read uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs? A few. Very few of you. I encourage you, believer, to read this book. And by the way, it's a book that stays updated. But it's a book which lists those who have died for the sake of Christ. Not every person, but it's... It'll blow you away to find out what had happened to believers in Rome. From that time, somewhere in the mid-60s, all the way till 300 and after 300, Christians were severely persecuted in the Roman Empire. Until about 300, there was this guy named Constantine, and his mother was somewhat religious. And so he decided he would make Christianity legal. And it's then that his mother went all over Israel and marked all the places which she called holy sites. And now there's Gothic churches all over these places in Israel now. Constantine made Christianity legal with, with the Edict of Milan. That's one of them. And then he began to call councils. By the way, this is when church and state merged. And so the councils weren't all that good. There were parts about it that were bad because now the emperor was the head of the church. But before that time, when Nero was there, it was severe persecution. Christians were driven underground, literally. They lived in the catacombs. They lived in all these tunnels where the graves were built under the city of Rome. They were driven out into the wilderness. And that's important to know, and we'll, we'll see at the end of the verses we're going to look at today, that that's kind of an overriding theme of the book of Mark, being in the wilderness. One of the first things that Jesus does is that he's driven into the wilderness when he, he begins his public ministry. And so we have Mark here writing during very difficult times. Christians are having it really, really hard. They're losing their jobs. They're losing their livelihood. They're losing their family. There are loved ones being killed, being brutalized, being eaten by beasts in the, in the arenas. And so there was, was a lot of bad things going on. Mark's writing to these people. And he's writing to them about this good news of Jesus. Now, one other thing I want to say, and I'll probably keep saying that. Uh, the good news didn't stop with, you must be born again, right? So that is the good news. But the gospel is way bigger than the gospel. Listen, Paul lived for the sake of the gospel, right? That's what we live for. We live for the gospel. So we get saved, but the gospel is not completed in our lives until one day we're in glory. Our salvation is not complete until it's completed and we're in glory. 
And I'm, I'm not saying you're only partly saved. No, I don't believe in that at all. I don't believe in losing your salvation and slowly getting saved. No, I believe you're saved if you're saved. I'm just saying that we still live on a sin-cursed earth. And until we're in heaven, we're going to suffer on a sin-cursed earth. No matter how much health food you eat or oils you buy, and those things can be good, but we live, live in a sin-cursed world. We're suffering the curse of sin, right? Amen. Are you with me on that? Amen. One day we'll be in glory. Amen. The gospel then is, what do we do about this thing that we've received when we accepted Christ as our Savior? It's about how we live. It's about what we choose to do. It's about what we value. Do we value the things that God values? Do we live the way God wants us to live? Mark is the first of all the Gospels written. And it's the foundation for what we call the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels are this. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay? John is not a synop Synoptic Gospels. The reason they're called the Synoptics is because Mark was written first. Matthew patterned his writing after Mark. Luke patterned his writing after Mark. They all used Mark as their their resource for guiding them through what they were writing. So Mark was a writer by profession. It was his vocation. These other guys used Mark's outline, so to speak, so to write their, their things down. One thing I love about Mark, he's very blunt, he's very abrupt. I mean, I think a lot of the farm type people would enjoy it. Just say what's gotta be said and get it over with, right? So that's what you're thinking right now. So let's move on. <laughs> Mark was very, very blunt. Get to Mark. Chapter 1, we get into our study. I urge you, by the way, to look up some of the stuff there that is on the back of your outline. On the front of your outline, I, I'm not going to give you detailed outlines often. I want you to think. I want you to participate in the story. So times have changed, haven't they? The fact that we do a service like this is pretty, pretty um, stark, stark contrast compared to Maybe 30 years ago, would we have done this 30 years ago here? Any, any of you been here 30 years? Would you have done a contemporary service here 30 years ago? See, times have changed, haven't they? How about a pastor up front without a suit, coat, and tie? And I'm heresy. I do have tattoos, by the way, but it's all from radiation. So My, my tattoo is a constellation. It's anything I want it to be. It used to be Atlas, and I'm... I'm going to tell you what it is now, but it used to be Atlas. Times have changed, huh? Amen. And they've really changed in our churches. And we want to be relevant, but we must never lose this, that the gospel has never changed. Amen? Amen. Amen. The Bible is still true. Yes, it is. The early chapters of Genesis are both literal and historical. Amen? Amen. Listen, if... If God created all things, and we believe that, right? Yes. And if there was a real flood and God destroyed the world, like the Bible says, we believe that, right? Yes. If God is in charge of all of that, if God created us, if God gives us the very next breath to breathe, then that means he gets to tell us why he created us and what to do and where to go and how to live our lives and what to think about things. That's an important consideration as we come to the book of Mark. Because I promise you, you will be challenged as we get into things. These first 13 verses are introductory, and we're going to walk through them a little bit. I keep trying to make sure I don't fall off the edge of this stage. Mark chapter 1, the beginning of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There it is. That is a declaration that we're going to see three times in the book of Mark. I'll come back to that when we get to the end of the sermon today. But we're talking about Jesus, who is the Christ. What would be the Old Testament word for Christ? Making you talk a lot today, huh? Angel. What's the Old Testament word for Christ? Angel of the Lord. No? Try again. It starts with an M. Maybe somebody said it. Messiah. Jesus, Messiah, the anointed one of God, the King that is to come. Jesus is... The Messiah. It was a newer term in some senses being used in Israel. And it was used to describe something that had been found all throughout scriptures. In fact, we, we, we hear a lot about it at Christmas time. We hear peace on earth, right? Jesus came to bring peace on earth. How much peace is there? Not here yet, right? 
Why isn't it here yet? Because the kingdom is not here in its completeness yet. Don't be fooled by the kingdom conversations that are taking place because I think they're changing the essence of the gospel. The kingdom is not here. The kingdom is yet to come in its fullness. Now it's here in this sense because we're here. We're future kingdom dwellers. And we have a king. He sits on the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Amen. So the kingdom exists, but it's not here yet on earth. One day Jesus is coming back. He's going to set his feet on this earth. He's going to establish his kingdom. There will be, I believe, a cleanup of this earth. I believe that there will be one government. And it will be King Jesus. Amen. No Republicans. No Democrats. No Trumps. No Clintons. I said that fast. <laughs> None of that. We're going to have one king. It will be Jesus. Amen. And when he comes... The government will be upon his shoulders. And his name should be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. No end. That's what I look forward to. Amen? Amen. He's going to set up his kingdom, but it's not yet here. But the Messiah was anointed in a sense. The anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, is Jesus. Amen. Note further that he's not just Jesus, he's the God-man. I talked to you a little bit about church history. I know it bores some of you to death, but in church history, one of the earliest controversies was the Arian controversy. Now, we're not talking about white supremacy, but Arius. Who knows what that controversy was about? Some of you probably do, but I, let me just say it. It was about the substance of who Jesus was. Is Jesus God? And in the earliest councils, the answer was yes. A really neat story. I don't know if it's true or not, but I, because I like it, I choose to believe it. Uh, it's about Arius going to the council and presenting this idea that Jesus was not God. And there was a man named Nicholas that walked up to Arius and punched him in the mouth. <laughs> This man's name was St. Nicholas. <laughs> he opposed the Arian controversy. By the way, who are the modern people who espouse the Arian controversy? They do not believe that Jesus is God. Yes, Jehovah's Witnesses. Even though they'll stand at your door and say, I use the King James Bible too. Oh yes, I believe in Jesus. I believe in salvation. But they do not believe that Jesus is God. And I'm telling you today that Jesus is the Messiah, Amen. the Son of God. Amen. That He is God in the flesh, the God-man. Yep. There's a theological term called the aseity of God or the aseity of Christ. And it means that Jesus exists without any necessary connection to anything outside of Himself. God exists without any necessary connection to anything outside of Himself. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need this earth. God is. But isn't it profound that he chooses to love us and to use us? And so Jesus is God. He's not a little bit God. He's not the small God. He is the God-man. Colossians tells, tells us that he created all things. And by him all things consist. He holds it together. That is Jesus. John tells us in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. That is Jesus Christ. Amen. Here to worship him today. Jesus is God. And that's a profound point and I'm not overstating it. I, I don't believe I am because of what we're going to see in a few moments in the book of Mark. Jesus is God. Verse 2, it says this. So we, we see scripture verifying that Jesus is God, verses 1 through 3. So as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. We remember Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. 
They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Before we get to verse 31, we have verse 3, where it's declared that the Messiah will come. And there's one that will come and make the way straight before the Messiah. And so scripture's confirming who Jesus is. In verse 4, John's declaring who Jesus is. So in verse 4, it says, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. We have a wilderness motif. I don't know enough about it to go too deep. I'm just saying that it's an idea of the wilderness. Christians were driven into the wilderness. They were driven out of Rome. They were very alone. They were stranded. They were torn apart by beasts. They were persecuted. Mark's writing to these Roman believers. And he's telling them that John was one that was also in the wilderness. John appeared baptizing. So let me talk to you about baptism. We practice here what we call believer's baptism, right? So if you're a believer, you can be baptized. That's what we do. We don't do infant baptisms. Not to my knowledge, do we? Okay, I'm just kidding. I know we don't. We practice believer's baptism. In other words, we call it that because you have to be a believer to be baptized. And the baptism then shows forth to those who can see it that you are a believer in Jesus Christ. John was pe preaching a baptism of repentance. Very similar. It wasn't all that different from what we do. Except John was saying, if you're going to repent of your sin, come and be baptized. John was not on the other side of the work of Jesus. He didn't understand everything we understand. He didn't know everything we know. We call his baptism a baptism of repentance. Now, did, he, did, did they repent because they got baptized? No, every, every single one of them put their foot in the water first because they believed and wanted to show that belief that they were repenting of their sin. And so we have a baptism. John's baptism, we have believer's baptism. Later in the passage, we're going to see Holy Spirit baptism. That is the idea that the Spirit enters in. By the way, if you wonder where the word baptizo comes from, it's not an English word. It, it, it was never translated. I think likely because King James didn't believe in immersion. And so they didn't translate that. And so it got into the King James Bible as baptism. But it means to immerse. Now it can mean other things. But given the culture and the times and what was going on there in Israel... It's likely referring to an immersion so that others could see that you were identifying with believers. So we have Holy Spirit baptism. We have baptism where we enter into Christ. Can you see it's used in a lot of different ways? There is one other way, and it was a way that was used in a secular fashion, though it was religious, but not, not in the same ways that we would use it. And that is if you wanted to become Jewish in your belief, but you were Italian or French, they would baptize you so that... There would be a public display to those who are seeing, uh, seeing it that you were identifying with the body of believers, that you believed. And so baptism was an idea or a concept borrowed from the times or the customs used for the purpose of the gospel that people would see that you are believing in Jesus Christ. I believe Romans chapter 6 gives a great picture of what baptism is about. The Bible says that we're buried with Christ by baptism into death raised again to new life. Now, Romans 6 isn't talking about water baptism, but it's the passage which gives us a very good understanding of what it looks like with the death of Christ. And so baptism is what we've chosen to follow. We believe that it is an ordinance here, and we believe in immersion here, though I don't talk condescendingly to others who do it differently. Those who pour believe that the pouring symbolizes the entering of the Holy Spirit into our body. And so I, I've had a lot of friends who believe differently. I'm just saying what we do here and what we do by conviction is baptism by immersion. So John came baptizing. People wanted to, to come to Christ. They repented. They got baptized. Now, a few things about John Baptist. He was in the country of Judea in all Jerusalem. And he was out in the wilderness. He didn't, he didn't rent out the, the local, you know, congregation local hall or whatever it is, a conference center where they do the concerts here in Lancaster or Reading. He didn't do that. He was in the wilderness. They went to him. So he's baptizing them. They're coming to him out in the wilderness, and he's clothed in camel's hair. And he wore a leather belt. Big leather belt, it sounds like. You know, it's like, oh, did the guy have a big leather belt? Yes. That's John the Baptist. He had this great big belt on. 
I'm kind of picturing what it's like when I watch, watch uh, Lawrence Welk, you know, the guys with a big white belt, you know, <laughs> it's like, did he have a big belt on? That's Lawrence Welk. Uh, no, but this guy defied the norms. He wasn't like everybody else. He dressed differently. He preached differently. He was in a different location. He was giving out the gospel. Defying the norms. So John came. He was clothed in camel's hair. He wore a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. So I think this guy was a hippie before he, hippies were even thought of. He was eating health food, local honey, and eating bugs. He was picking locust you know, legs out from his teeth. And there he is out in the wilderness, and they're coming to him and listening to him, and he's proclaiming the truth. He was very pointed. He, was not, he, wa he wasn't seeker-sensitive. He wasn't doing seeker services. They would come to him, and he would call them hip hip hypocrites. He was very confrontational. But he was preaching about Jesus, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I. He knew of Jesus. His, his, their mothers knew each other, Mary and Elizabeth. They knew what they had been called to do. And he's preaching about Jesus. He's making his way straight. In other words, John's ministry was, was gathering the crowds, getting everybody ready to, to see this thing that hadn't been done in Israel in this way. Not for a long, long time anyway. There was a guy preaching and everybody was going to him. Well, they're getting used to this. They're going to listen to him preach. At the end of his ministry, Jesus comes on the scene. The, the crowds are already to gather to Jesus. So John made his way straight. John says this, I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He gave the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, who, by the way, indwells us. Verse 9, it says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. So can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's what the saying is. My wife and I just moved from Nazareth, so. <laughs> he was baptizing at the Jordan. And here we have God himself declaring that Jesus is God. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open. And the spirit descending on him like a dove and a voice from heaven saying, you are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. The son of God. Jesus is God. Verse 12 says this, the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. The wilderness motif. He was in the wilderness 40 days. He was tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals. And he was all alone except the angels that ministered to him. The people of Rome would have been saying, I think I can relate. But then what does this story have to do with us? Like, what can we do about this today? Now I think this... This, these first 13 verses are strategic in the book of Mark. I believe that what's happening here is Mark is writing this so that you would join with Jesus and the disciples on their mission. The mission. That's the announcement that Darren couldn't give because he didn't know what it was about. The mission. Will you join in the mission? Will you join in the journey? As we go through the book of Mark, we're going to see the disciples going through through time after time, a crisis of belief. Now, there are points in our lives where we come to these crises, where things happen or there's things going on or there's a point in our life where we sit back and we wonder, do I really believe? Do I really trust? Will God provide? Can I follow him? And we do come to those times. I think everybody comes to those times. It's like a teenager that got saved young. Somewhere in their mid-teens or late-teens are going to say, do I believe this because I believe this, or do I believe this because mom and dad believe this? There's times when we're challenged to believe. <clears throat> over and over, the disciples are challenged to believe. And the truth is, is they don't get it until the very end of Jesus' ministry. They don't get it all the way until the end. By the way, have you ever wondered, why did Jesus say, don't tell anybody about the miracle I just performed? Have you ever wondered about that? One of the reasons is because people wouldn't understand the whole story of Christ until it was finished. When he cried out, it is finished. And it wasn't just that he died that he was proclaiming. He was, he was proclaiming that I finished the work. Now go tell everybody the miracles you've seen because it's all going to make sense. 
And the gospel has been made clear now to join on the mission, to be on the mission. The disciples didn't get it. Even at the end of Jesus' ministry, they're at the Last Supper, what were the disciples arguing about? Who would be greatest? They're like arguing about who's going to be the, the, the governor and who's going to be the attorney general and who's going to be the most important person in your... And uh, Jesus is like telling them over and over, I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified. And they're saying, no, 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 no. We're going to be a part of your cabinet. I want One guy wants to sit on your right and the other on... That's what the one mother wanted. My mother would have done that, I'm sure. <laughs> and Jesus is saying, you guys got it all wrong. Even up to the end of Jesus' ministry, they still had it wrong. Jesus performed a miracle on the Sea of Galilee, and they, they got to the edge of the sea. Their boat comes to rest, and they're like, whoa, who is this man? He must be God. And Jesus is like, have you been with me so long, and you still don't understand? Turn with me to chapter 8. I'm near the end. Chapter 8, verse 38. So, I want you to imagine this. Jesus and his disciples are in northern Israel. They're in the area, they're in the north, north area of what is known today as the Golan Plates. They're way up in very lush land. That's where cattle would have grazed. It's beautiful. And in the extreme north is where Dan settled in disobedience to God. And it's near there, actually that whole area known as Caesarea Philippi. Now there's another Caesarea along the, the Mediterranean. This isn't that one. This is Caesarea Philippi. And if you were to walk past Caesarea of Philippi, the road goes along and there's a big cliff, like what Lisa and I saw this week. I think Chickie's Hill, is that how you say it? Cheeks Hill? I don't know. Chickie's Rock. It's a big rock. And all, oh, all right, enough. <laughs> You'll have lots of chances to laugh at me in the years to come. All over the cliff is carved statues and little places of worship. It's all over the cliff. And right in the middle of all of that is a great big hole. You can look it up on your iPad if you don't believe me. Great big hole. And the hole went down. They used to believe it was a bottomless pit. And they called it the gates of hell. And as they walked along there, Jesus is walking them. They, maybe they weren't right there, but it had to have been in a, a close vicinity of where Jesus and his disciples were. Jesus is in the, in the vicinity of all those false idols, and he says, who do people say that I am? Well, some say Isaiah, or uh, Elijah, and some, some say John the Baptist. They thought he'd raised from the dead somehow. And then Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Peter proclaimed, thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, Peter. And the gates of hell will not prevail against this church. On this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Pretty profound, huh? Halfway through the book, we have a declaration by Peter. Finally, someone saw that Jesus was God. And then we really see them struggling really bad until chapter 15. And it's chapter 15, where it's not the disciples who finally get it. It's an Italian soldier. Chapter 15. Any Italians here today? We didn't have any in the first service. All right, that's the difference between the services. We got Italians in this one. Chapter 15 and verse 39. Jesus was on the cross. It was cried out, it is finished. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. Those two passages are strategic to the book of Mark. If you want to understand it, understand this, that Jesus is God. So what difference does that make? Let me tell you, if you're here today and you're not a believer, I want you to know that Jesus is God. Amen. He is the creator. He is the sustainer. And he has the right to tell you to repent of your sin. He doesn't need you. He wants you. And he loves you. Won't you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior?
The Bible has commanded that all men everywhere must repent. If you have not repented of your sin, you are not God's child. It's that simple. If you are not God's child today, won't you repent of your sin? Without any regard to Calvinism, Arminianism, none of that. Think of this. If you have not repented, that's the one thing we have in common, besides our salvation, that we all have come in repentance. Now, now you might say, well, faith and repentance. You just said repent, and I thought it was faith. So if I said to you, what, what must I do to be saved? You would say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Right? So what's this idea of repentance? Faith and repentance are the same thing. I once heard a man say, well, the kids didn't really get saved because they didn't repent. Wait a minute. It's not faith plus repentance. It's by faith alone. Sola fide. We still believe that, right? Amen. Salvation by faith alone in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It's by faith alone. It's by grace alone. It's by scripture alone. We believe those things. And so by faith, we accept Christ as our Savior. But some of you have been in recovery, right? When you got saved, you fell on your knees before God likely. And you said, God, how have I wasted my life? But a child who comes to God at four or five years old is not likely going to feel that same weight and burden you do. That doesn't mean they didn't repent. It just means that their repentance was an embracing of God. God, I love you. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds more. It doesn't mean there's more grace for some people than others. It just means there are people in this room who know more about the grace of God than others of you. The grace of God is large. A child doesn't repent the same way an adult does. And so it's the same thing to repent. And if you have not repented, I urge you, you must repent of your sin. For the believer, what difference does this make? This makes a huge difference for believers. A huge difference. Because is Jesus God? Yes. He's the God-man. He created all things. He created you. He created me. And therefore, he has the right to tell you what to do. Amen. He has the right to tell you how to live. He has the right to tell you what he believes marriage is. He has the right to appoint to you a gender. He has the right to tell you that you should live your life for him. He has the right to tell you to fellowship with believers. He has the right to tell you to pray. He has a, a, the right to tell you to know more about him and his word. He has the right to tell you how to spend your money. And we're going to deal with a lot of these things in the book of Mark. I, 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 I promise you some of you are going to be a little bit pinched. And nobody's told me about you ahead of time, so it's not bad. I'm not writing these sermons for you, but I'm telling you that I'm going to be pitched, and so are you as we go through this. Jesus is God, and that gives him the right, and that gives him the authority. And by the way, it's not bad news. It's not oppressive. It is the good news that he, he showed us the way to blessing. He showed us the way to prosperity. He showed us the way to live our lives. And as we live out our lives, he blesses us for it, and we praise God for that. Because we know today that Jesus is God. Amen? Amen. God, I thank you so much.